Tonight's presentation, although edited for YouTube, contains imagery and subject matter some may find disturbing. While our program is educational, we still feel that viewer discretion is advised. In response to the last video, we had received an overwhelming number of requests to cover people we missed, and understandably so, some of these people are god-awful. Honestly, there's almost two decades of drama on this website, and my ability to cover everything is limited by my time and my need to pump out a video more than every three months. Uh, sometimes, I feel like it's just better to reward good content and highlighting it and directing people towards that than it is to wallow in the worst of the worst. Sometimes, if you go looking for garbage, all you're going to be able to see is garbage, and that makes life horrible. That said, we did have some content that never made it into the original video. We're going to be repurposing some of that never before seen script and taking in a request or two from the comments and making a follow up so we can cover some more YouTubers and bring attention to some situations that are ongoing and I feel need more discussion. Also, we got an update to the Chris Hansen situation. According to USA Today, a week after the publication of my last video, the TV personality was subpoenaed to be in court in Shalo I Shalawasi County. I, I live in Michigan. I can't pronounce that. It's about 30 minutes from my house. But Chris Hansen failed to show up and present critical evidence for a sex trafficking case. So, still mishandling evidence involving many serious cases and is now facing actual punitive measures from the United States government. I will say I am glad that, you know, someone's actually holding him accountable for some of his less than acceptable behavior. In fact, just about everyone on this list has either committed a crime or done something that goes against every moral I hold dear. And we hope that earns the title, five even worse YouTubers. Because this time around, it's god awful. Due to an even higher likelihood of demonetization this time around, we were lucky enough to find a sponsor that would let me make the video I want regardless of what YouTube says. So with that out of the way, this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is a fantasy RPG that can be played on both mobile and PCs. Best described as a hero collectathon that features a variety of unique factions that you can collect from. Today we have been asked to talk about the Banner Lords, which is a completely human faction inspired by medieval Europe that has beef with their former allies, the High Elves. Maybe they're good, maybe they're evil, well that's for you to find out. All I know is that this one's looking pretty fly, and personally, story is the main reason why I play video games, and it's clear that these guys are trying to do something unique with a phone game. Coming to raids specifically this month is a series of summer content and events, like fusion events that grant brand new legendary champions, PvP tournaments, and five completely new champions being added just this month which look pretty damn cool. With brands making new game changing updates which are coming soon and a variety of content able to be played today right now, well now is the best time to get started. If any of this has sounded interesting to you at all, feel free to go to the link in the description below or scan my QR code and you'll get an epic hero, Chanoru, which works well at that Doom Tower we talked about last month. On top of a new epic champion, you'll get 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 ancient shard that you can summon a rad new champion as soon as you get into the game. You can find all the rewards right here in your inbox for the next 30 days only, and only for brand new players. So with that said, sit back, relax, and prepare to be unsettled as we dive into the most unsettling content creators on the platform. When somebody has been hurt, perhaps one of the most frustrating ways the perpetrator can respond is by acting like nothing is wrong. In the case of Craig Thompson, or Mini Lad, his attempts to bury the manipulation and predatory behaviour of his past went beyond the facade of complacency, extending into deliberate attempts to obfuscate the allegations against him in order to make the drama blow over more quickly, in spite of the gravity of his misconduct. Considering the fact that Craig, like a number of the other YouTubers on our list, 
has also underdelivered on promises to work on himself and get better, this misconduct bears repeating, if only to prevent the further victimization of underage fans interacting with his second channel, which has actually resumed posting videos just a few short weeks ago. In the summer of 2020, two young women named Hallie and Ash used Twitter to detail the experiences they had with Craig Thompson using his status and mental health to manipulate them at the ages of 16 and 17. In summary, Craig persisted in messaging these girls, even when he knew their age, contacting them inappropriately to solicit nude photos and even attempting to meet up in real life. It's worth noting that Craig had already been called out for a suspicious pattern of interacting with underage fans through Twitter DMs and Snapchat as early as 2016. Like this Tumblr post which documents his creepy behaviour, Craig Thompson would go on to confirm the truth of the allegations Hallie and Ash had bravely raised, claiming in a response that he planned to go on hiatus from the internet until he got the help he needed. Now, unfortunately, this hiatus would only last for a month before Craig resumed posting Minecraft videos, marking the beginning of a trend where Craig would half-heartedly promise to stop posting videos and seek help, only for him to resume his normal behaviour when he thought it was safe to do so. In response to Craig Thompson's return, one of his former victims, Hallie, presented receipts which painted a clearer picture of Craig's true attitude towards the situation. In a series of screenshots documenting dismissive messages Craig had sent to his Discord moderators, it's revealed that he fully expected the outcry against his actions to be drowned out by new posts, and that he expected it to fully die once he resumed working with brands. Not only did Hailey bring Craig's dismissive attitude to everyone's attention, but she also revealed how low Craig was willing to sink in order to manipulate others. In further screenshots included in Hailey's video, Craig can be seen not only holding the fact that he is suicidal over an underage fan's head, but also implicating that if she came forwards, he and hundreds of his fans would take their own lives. Now by this point, it was clear that Craig Thompson was not seeking help like he had promised, which led to a mounting backlash prompting video response. In his first apology video, Clearing the Air, Craig attempts to debunk claims that he had met or physically engaged with these girls in real life. This video can be seen as selectively addressing the issues at best and deliberately distracting from the real issues at worst. You see, nobody had been asserting that Craig physically abused any of his underage fans, but still, Craig chose to make this the primary focus of his video, ignoring the fact that the messages he sent suggested that he did intend to meet up. This video also ignores the criticisms levied against Craig's dismissive attitude towards the backlash he received and the way he pressured those he mistreated with the prospect of his fans taking their own lives. Now, Despite poor reception to his first apology, Craig resumed posting videos yet again, carrying on as if nothing was wrong, even as each video was ratioed into oblivion. Holding on to this facade is the most insulting and reductive way he could have possibly responded, both insulting to the experiences of the victims Craig left in his wake, and insulting to the intelligence of his fans and detractors, who just wanted to see Craig finally take his actions seriously. In December 2020, Craig would go on to insincerely apologize a second time, both for the inappropriate way he had interacted with underage fans and for his failure to respond to the controversy. Now, this second video, titled My Apology, also received poor reception, due in large part to what he didn't include. Perhaps to save face, Craig chose not to address any of the evidence which had been raised against him or even admit or explain what he had done for that matter, continuing the deficit of transparency between Craig and his audience. In the video, Craig largely pointed towards mental health once again as the underlying factor behind his mistakes, reiterating a message he had sent outlining his thought process while suicidal. In Craig's mind, he figured that if he was going to take his own life, he would at least go down swinging. Why Craig believes that he deserves any sympathy for trying to drag other people down with him in this self-destructive downward spiral is anyone's guess. Craig also alludes multiple times to a PR team which he had to fight in order to message his private apologies to Hallie and Ash months after the start of the controversy, and that they also contributed to Craig dropping the ball with his response. Now, Even if this PR team is real, which there is no evidence to confirm or deny, this only shows an unwillingness to take accountability for trying to bury his past and the allegations raised against him. As of the posting of this video, Craig Thompson has returned yet again after promising promising to leave the platform and get help. Even after admitting to the misconduct, trying and failing to move past the controversy while appealing to the pity of others to preserve his image, Craig continues to go through the motions of acting remorseful 
while continuing business as usual. Carefully selecting what he is willing to admit to and discuss in his video apologies has resulted in many of his young fans holding a skewed opinion of the allegations raised or not even being aware of those allegations in the first place. After the events of the past year, it's apparent that Craig Thompson will not be stepping down from the platform of his own accord. For this reason, it's important to remember how Minilad breached the YouTube community's trust in the first place and resist further attempts at manipulation. This one hurts me to write because in a video that I, I don't know where it is on my channel, but I'm pretty sure it's still uploaded. I talked about my top five favorite YouTubers of all time. One of those being Shane Dawson. At the time, I was like a teenager. I hadn't watched his channel in a while. And when I did watch his channel, well, I didn't exactly know what blackface was. So correcting that. Today, we're going to be talking about Shane Dawson. Starting his channel in 2008, Shane had found great success producing edgy skit comedy videos in a similar vein to Ryan Higa, Smosh, and Fred. Unlike those other content creators, however, Shane found himself in a cycle of drama that pops up every few years or so, ultimately resulting in a non-apology video and everyone forgiving him. This all changed on June 26 of 2020, which would mark the last post Shane would make on any social media until about a week ago while I was writing this script. Leaving behind a combined audience of roughly 30 million followers, Shane undoubtedly has enough money in the bank to retire and then some. Shane Dawson's merch store is still even selling $125 mystery boxes, although the type of person to actually buy one of those mystery boxes, considering the gravity of the allegations against them, is questionable to say the least. These allegations would include blatant racism in the form of modern day minstrel shows, sexual misconduct with underage fans, pedophilic content and justifications for said content, both as the creator's persona and in now old deleted vlogs, plagiarism, and generally being manipulative and abusive to the people that works under him. Really annoyed because I feel like I have not come across any less than a collaborative person. To begin addressing these claims, it's important to understand that the foundation of Shane's style of comedy is politically incorrect humor, which credit where credit is due, he has apologized profusely for. It's just up to you if you want to believe those apologies. It's also important to understand that audiences have been criticizing this behavior from the beginning. A common misconception is that Shane is only facing criticism now because of cancel culture and the current political climate, but that's simply not true. Shane has always been facing criticism as he's been consistently called out by live audiences, the film industry, and mainstream news sources as early as 2012. Take for example this post by the YouTube Gazette, where it stated that Dawson had young girls go on stage at VidCon and impersonate black women using words like chicken and ghetto multiple times while making his usual pedophilic jokes. It seems that making jokes about being a pedophile and exclusively making jokes at the expense of black people loses any humor that can be derived from it when you're telling these jokes in person to an audience of mostly 12 to 15 year olds. I mean, it's awkward. When I first saw this footage, I was left incredibly uncomfortable as I've also been to VidCon and the vast majority of attendees are very young girls going with their parents. That's just the primary demographic that you see there. When VidCon was confronted with this information by both the Washington Post and a series of Twitter posts from uncomfortable attendees, Hank Green, yes, that Hank Green, the then head of CEO released no comment or had anything to say about the issue. Other sites made posts about Shane, and content creators on YouTube would even go on to make videos about how strange and potentially harmful it was that his minstrel show style of comedy was constantly being pushed to the front of the trending page. If he did, he wouldn't fall back on those old, tired, offensive, apish stereotypes to portray black characters in a humorous way. The Washington Post also wrote an informative article back in 2014 which covered Shane's response to his critics which, as you can see, is nothing short of horrible. Then in 2015, there was an incident where Vanity Fair accused Shane Dawson of joke theft 
and plagiarism, which is something that I don't exactly have the time or knowledge to definitively prove, as I don't know every joke written by every single person and I can't just go through all of his content, but Shane Dawson, however, did upload a video hosted by the content creator Destery, who would go on to steal I Hate Everything's Dura Plant joke basically verbatim. Like, that's not an exaggeration, that is precisely what this shit is. Like, that's not an exaggeration, that's exactly what this shit is. While it's unknown whether or not Shane knew that this specific content was stolen at the time it was uploaded, he still has it on his channel despite many comments pointing it out, as well as an I Hate Everything video with over 2 million views bringing light to the situation. When Shane Dawson was deleting over a billion views worth in videos, never once did it cross his mind to delete the actual plagiarism still on his channel, nor has he ever addressed it as far as we could find. Finally, we have a plethora of awkward jokes made about cheese pizza, like many found in his miniseries called Hey Millie, which was made in collaboration with everyone's favorite YouTubers, the Fine Brothers. Basically, it's about an eight-year-old puppet girl who idolizes Shane, both the real person and his many characters. Millie is generally confused about sex, which becomes a punchline for these videos, as she finds herself in inappropriate situations, unknowingly asked to be in these situations, or even being just molested outright, and that's the joke. For example, in one episode, Millie goes into detail about how hot Selena Gomez is because she's underdeveloped, which makes Shane Shane's character SDZ murder her because he's embarrassed about getting too excited in his pants. He also used to upload videos like this as side content for that channel. Considering Shane at this point knew that his audience is mostly children and promoted this channel to his audience of mostly underage teenage girls, this is incredibly uncomfortable and creepy to go back to. And as of right now, for obvious reasons, every video on this Hey Millie channel was deleted. But the worst thing to ever go on it would probably have to be a parody of Whip My Hair by Willow Smith, who was 11 years old at the time. Millie sings along with Shane's character, Shanene, about how she's going to whip her chest back and forth in much more colorful language than I'm comfortable using, and then claims she's going to get plastic surgery when they're not big enough when she's, you know, not eight years old, and she can tell I'm incredibly uncomfortable describing this, and this is all made the worse when Shane was later caught doing this to a Willow Smith poster. Oh, God. Oh, I'll whip your hair back and forth. Mortifyingly enough, this was also seen by both Jaden and Jada Smith, Willow's brother and mother respectively. While this content undoubtedly makes me uncomfortable even to talk about in retrospect, I could even possibly forgive it if that was it, but that's not the end of it because video after video surfaced exposing Shane Dawson's weird pedophilic undertones, both in character and in real life. Keep in mind that these videos were willingly posted by Shane to his own channel, like this vlog where Shane and his girlfriend at the time are seen putting up a peep in his 12 year old cousin's skirt while asking if she knows what sex feels like. And then there's another one where Shane and his mom are pressuring teenagers on Omegle to strip and twerk for them. This presents a clear pattern of Shane getting kids to do sexually suggestive things both in the context of comedy and in real life for his content. Here are the facts of the matter. Shane has been getting called out for his negligent behavior for over a decade, and only recently did his content change. Every time I watch another apology video, I have to admit, I get sucked in. I want to forgive him. This guy is really damn good at acting. He seems that he's really gonna change and he gets why people are mad, but then he doesn't, which to me is the scariest thing about him. In 2014, he apologized for all the blackface he did, like he did now almost a year ago. But on Twitter, he was calling his female critics, hashtag thirsty, while going on and on about how he doesn't understand why people think he might be a little racist, and everything else we mentioned so far. 
On top of that, he surrounds himself with horrible content creators also known for scamming their audience, like Gabby Hanna, who said this one time. So here's the clip. Context not really needed. At all. Honestly. So Gabby Hanna and Shane Dawson. Are they hot? The neighbors. <laughs> They're like actual kids. <laughs> okay, are they hot? <laughs> Story time, me and the Gabby show. My neighbor kids. This one's great. <laughs> Behind the scenes, however, Shane is dismissive and manipulative. When people try to stand in his way, he either ignores the problem until it blows up or cuts that person off entirely. Just look at how he acted during the production of his 2014 film, Not Cool. Logic of being picky when you have no job well no but that's the problem they do have job and, and one woman in particular who's a professor who's up for tenure well job. then why am i seeing professors where so, are the actors it's well, a smaller more limited talent pool somebody out there is a rat and they're going around saying this is the raunchiest movie ever made and it's pissing me the off it's been mentioned many many times the is a problem for people so if we just like lose that i'm just saying i'm not taking anything out of the movie to please a bunch of out of work actors in Pittsburgh who should be lucky to get an audition for a feature film. Shane, stop it. You can't go. We have I'm too much go. to do. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do this in my hotel. I don't need to. I don't need to hear the pick party stuff. Right. All that's fine. But right. to actually hear it, like, I don't need to. <laughs> we have a movie that can still be better, but in the way that you envision it. Not about changing your vision. Do you see it as something that you still want to work on of and make course. better? And you then... guys, I'm really annoyed because I feel like I have not come across any less than a collaborative person to it. You won't read the notes? I want to see all the notes. You not said the that. opposite to me. Single I read every single one. I'm interested to hear like well, specific just... things. The one note from over half the people that wrote it on the cards was the movie was too long. I had issues with the every suggestion, everything. I've never like yelled at you guys that I don't know. Like if I just want an extra beat somewhere, like I feel like I deserve it at this point. <laughs> I've been yelled at <laughs> for the record. He had a similar experience when making his line of conspiracy makeup with the controversial YouTuber Jeffree Star. And after watching these clips, I have to say he honestly might be a nightmare to work with. His new stuff is a mixed bag, but I would not really say it's the worst content that you can consume. Personally speaking, I want to believe that people can change, and to some extent, I think Shane has. But how many times can you apologize, then spit in the face of that apology, then apologize again? before it gets old. He's openly admitted that the last time he said sorry, it was just an act, and yeah, based on his Twitter, I believe that. He's done so much that would get basically anyone else exiled from the entertainment industry 10 times over, even looking at a contemporary YouTuber like Jenna Marbles, who has a similar sub count, who did blackface once to impersonate Mickey Minaj, quit YouTube entirely over the controversy. But I'm literally not trying to put out negative things into the world. So I've privated a lot of my old content because I just don't want anyone to feel upset about anything. I, I, I don't want to contribute to that. I don't want, I, I don't care. I don't care. I just don't care. I don't want someone to watch something and feel hurt or offended now for any reason. For that, I am so unbelievably sorry that this isn't okay and it hasn't existed on the internet for a long time because it's not okay. And I haven't done anything remotely like that because I heard people say, this is blackface and I don't like that. And I, I just would never want to put that into the world. So this has been private for a long time, but I do want to tell you how unbelievably sorry I am if I ever offended you by posting this video. It's awful, it doesn't need to exist. It's inexcusable. It's not okay. I'm, I'm incredibly sorry if this offended you. Then, now, whenever. It doesn't need to exist. It shouldn't have existed. I shouldn't have said that, ever. It's not cool, it's not cute, it's not okay. And I'm embarrassed that I ever made that, <laughs> period. 
like I said, I want to believe Shane can change, but a part of me knows that he's extremely good at manipulating his general audience and pretending to feel sorry, like with the 2014 apology, or to just look up any apology he's done over the years and you'll see what I mean. If I have to ask if a person screwed their cat or is attracted to children, in my opinion Shane has abused the children, whether it's intentional or not, or is outright racist, are they really worth watching when there's so many other amazing content creators? People like Blame It On Jorge do the unsolved mystery thing way better. I mean, it doesn't take him 42 parts to get to the point, and if you're looking for something a little less scripted like Shane's videos are, a YouTuber by the name of Windigoon does the whole creepy iceberg thing really damn well, and it feels like you're just having a conversation with the dude. All I'm saying is, is that no matter what kind of genre you're looking into, there's there's an amazing amount of undiscovered content creators out there, so why keep giving Shane Dawson our attention when there's so many other people who don't do awful things, yet can produce a similar quality of work? At worst, Shane Dawson is a criminal in disguise who's good at manipulating people. At best, he's criminally negligent and unwilling or unable to change easily. And considering he announces intentions on coming back via an Instagram post like many other content creators on this list, I have to say, it's time for me to unsubscribe and find something far, far, far better to watch. Starting his YouTube channel on February 15th, 2013, Kiwi's found moderate success uploading Call of Duty trickshot videos and even finding himself being invited to esports groups such as Red Reserve and Obey. In 2016, however, it came out that he had been in a romantic relationship with a 14-year-old when he was 19. According to the mother of the victim, the relationship may have even started when he was 17 and she was only 12. During a Keemstar interview, he did his best to dispute this. I was 17 at the time, and I understand she was 14 or 13, however old she was. Wait, but wait, there's, there's, if you were 17, wouldn't that make her 12? No. A year and a half ago, she would have been 12. Normally, I would go through the receipts and try to prove what he did and be super factual and all that, but fortunately, I don't have to, as he admitted it during a Keemstar interview at the time. The problem has little to do if he did it or if he didn't do it, but rather how much he blames the victim for it happening in the first place, which is a first if I've ever heard one. In this interview, Kiwis, Keemstar, the victim, and the victim's mother as well as a few other people involved hash it out. Despite our personal distaste for Keemstar and the way he's handled notable cases in the past, this is one of the times where he took a respectful tone and actually managed to get this guy to incriminate himself in a way I don't even think a police interrogation could. Having an inappropriate relationship with a minor that was that young would be more than enough to put you on this list because that's horrible. However, this guy is worse than just horrible, and it goes beyond that. He doesn't even dispute sending nude images of himself or soliciting nudes from the victim when she was 12 and he was 14. And um, after that, we didn't really talk after that because I felt really bad um, because okay, so it, you it's sent, just, it was you just sent, weird. You sent pictures when you were 17 and she was 12. Now, I believe she said that she you said she was 14. I believe and the kick logs will the kick logs will prove it. Like if you guys get it, like okay. It's there, but she like. said she was fourteen or whatever. But I bu but it she was, was a month ago. Yeah, and a month ago on Snapchat. Yes. Okay, so a month ago you sent her a picture. Yes. But the problem with that is you're nineteen and she's fourteen at the time. This relationship continued on until Kiwis was 19 and she was 14. It's not hard to see Kiwis as the Fortnite version of Cosmodor when he blames his actions on the victim. Like she was saying how she was so attached to me and I, I was saying and she said how she wanted to meet up and I said that's really weird. I don't want to meet up like that's something you can't bank on. Like that's just really weird. I, I don't want to do that. Being a stupid teen. And it was a one time thing being a 
horny teenager with hormones like being stupid okay. i don't know it it was just being stupid it's just being stupid being a teenager it's being dumb and everyone's favorite scapegoat for pedophilia depression but the th the thing like I was in a really like depressed state. The facts of the matter as I see them and doing my own research is as follows. Kiwis has a sizable audience and quite a bit of influence over them, which will only make everything worse later. This relationship started when he was 17 and her being 12. And yeah, if we're going to be real here, I can see this guy making a one-time mistake when he was 17 and doing something that he never should have done. But that's not what he did. He continued to have this relationship until he was 19. He still held on to this relationship with someone he believed to be 14, possibly younger, till about one month before the 2016 Keemstar interview. It only becomes more insulting when he blames depression, which is something that both me and my roommate suffer from, and we can definitely say from personal experience, does not make you want to have relationships with young kids. The interview ended with Kiwis blaming cancel culture, followed by begging Keem's audience not to send images to minors in a way reminiscent of a G.I. Joe PSA, finishing the whole ordeal by actually blaming the victim. The, pr the problem is Kiwi is like one person's an adult and they have to know better and, and it doesn't matter what the kid says. That's I know, I, under I understand that. He would block me like if I was being an issue. And I also just with the pictures, you had to have known she was younger. I'm sorry, no. I mean, when this started a year and a half ago. I truly believe she was 15. Like, she looks 15 to me. But I mean, if she's sending you uh, graphic pictures when she's 12, I mean, you should be able to figure out. There's that, no way. Yeah. Yeah. That she's not. She what? She wasn't. Tw she wasn't 12. She was 13. She said she was 14. She lied. Taking a one month break from the internet, Kiwi's returned to his normal content and even uploaded a video titled My Story, where he goes on to thank everyone that supported him blindly while calling anyone that thought critically about the subject narrow minded. Kiwi's main argument in the video is that the victim lied as he believed her to be 13 or 14, which in most states would still put her under the minimum age of consent and put him above the actual age of consent. Keep in mind that he believes he is innocent of any crime because he thinks it's acceptable for a 17 year old to accept and receive nudes from a 14 year old. Just imagine the image of a almost senior in high school walking into park romantically with a person who had just left elementary for the first time. Furthermore, Kiwi's account of the victim's age changes from video to video, the youngest age I've heard mentioned being 13. So even if the victim did not lie and she was actually these ages that he reported her being, it would still be highly immoral and still very illegal. As the adult of the situation, he should have never sent anything to someone that young, no matter what they said or how they asked. He was sending nudes to this person before even knowing her for a year or even her true age. Then he continued to do so until the very moment he got caught. And it's that part I like to focus on. This didn't stop until one month before the Keemstar interview. He kept doing this repeatedly for like two years. Time and time again, he keeps trying to twist the situation so that it's the 12 to 14 year old's fault instead of taking any responsibility himself. This girl lied about her age and convinced me to send her pictures of myself. Like she sent pictures to me too, but it was it was a group effort, you know what I mean? Like it wasn't just like, there was no harassment. There, it was all consent and I know that she's younger and it, it's, but you're a teenager, dude, like. Before the interview was deleted off of Keemstar's channel, shockingly enough, for every three likes, there was about one dislike. And on December 8th of 2020, Jaden's video, Kiwi's Response, has almost a 50 to 50 dislike ratio, which is kind of insane when we're talking about someone who blatantly admitted that having relations with a minor. Uh, many of the commenters don't seem to understand that the victim was 12 years old at the time, and at the oldest, 14. They take Kiwi's word at face value that she's a lying 14-year-old slut of some kind, while others just don't care and want to see more epic Fortnite videos. Disgustingly enough, 
Kiwis had done it. Without actually really apologizing or owning up to anything, he managed to spin a narrative that paints his young 14-year-old victim as a master manipulator that has relationships with any content creator so that she may destroy their lives, while he was a poor, defenseless, stupid teen that fell for her manipulation, which his very young audience actively fight people over to this day. Why did you that girl? Oh, uh, you think you're funny? <laughs> yes. That is not funny at all, dude. All right, you gotta leave me. <laughs> you wanna leave, bud? Um, that, you gotta get out of the house. What, what, why did you do you it? You gotta get out of the house. Why did I? Do you even know what, the story? What? Come on, yeah, get, yeah, get, yeah, I know the whole story. Get, get, get out of the fucking house. Why did you do it? What's why did you do it? You sent your dick online. Yeah, to a girl hey, that, was him. Four, him. that was keep 14 years old. Door that was 14 years old. Do you realize that? Do you, do you not understand hey, that she out. completely lied about her age? Get out of the house. It's proven. Get out of the house. That's why I'm here. Despite the very damning evidence and seriousness of these claims that Kiwis has openly admitted to, he has never been properly arrested for crimes related to sexual misconduct, and his channel has gone from a couple hundred thousand to over three million in just the past few years. It's likely that due to how complicated this case would have been, the DA just chose not to prosecute and watch to see if he would commit yet another crime that would be a bit more damning. Kiwis even uses this lack of arrest to paint his victim as even more of a liar in private conversations. In 2020, Kiwis has even managed to get a verification badge on Twitter, which is often out of reach for most regular YouTubers. To this day, Kiwis has not owned up to what he did and even went a step further and weaponized his audience against a person that he wronged and no one seems to really care. Luckily, due to Kiwis getting that oh-so-coveted verification badge, more and more people are talking about it again. He and his viewership has been sinking, and more people are unsubscribing. To us, he's just as bad, if not worse, than Cosmodor, and it's only made the more disturbing as he now focuses almost exclusively on Fortnite videos, where he routinely offers money to his young viewership, many of which can't comprehend the gravity of what he has done and likely won't watch this video unless if it is to dislike. While I am under no illusions that my word can do anything about this, I do hope that people who watch this can at least get informed about the horrible person behind the Kiwi's YouTube channel. In cases where an influencer uses their popularity and status to coerce members of their audience, like many of the alleged child grooms who appeared on our list, it's pretty easy to see how the victim was manipulated by a skewed balance of power. Maybe that's why acts of animal abuse are so frustrating to witness, or even hear about. Pets trust their human caretakers implicitly, depending on us to keep them safe and hold their best interests at heart. It would take a truly vile individual to betray that trust, going as far as to abuse their pets for personal sexual gratification. For YouTuber and zoo sadist Kiro the Wolf, however, sexual abuse committed against his own pet is only the surface of the allegations leveled against him. To explain without putting too fine a point on it, zoo sadists are as horrible as the name makes them sound. Even a painful death sometimes is not enough to spare these pets humiliation. Since these activities are so completely reprehensible, it's obvious to see why individuals like Kiro wouldn't advertise their involvement. Instead, Kiro met like-minded people through the furry fandom and alternative messaging applications like Telegram, which use end-to-end -end encryption. When Kiro the Wolf began to gain traction on his YouTube channel thanks to an interview with Shane Dawson on his Weird Side of YouTube series, this gave Kiro significant renown within the furry YouTube sphere. Of course, this interview would later become unlisted from Shane's channel when allegations surrounding Kiro the Wolf surfaced, which would not only connect him to a ring of high-profile zoo sadists, but would also lead him to admit that he sexually abused his own dog. In September 2018, a Twitter user named Zoodonym acted as a whistleblower against a ring of pedophiles and zoo sadists operating within the furry fandom. The user, who was also a zoophile, leaked incriminating video, photos and chat logs while directing people to the zoo sadist evidence group on Telegram, which no longer exists. Among the higher profile individuals to be exposed in this Twitter post was Ruben Marrero Pernas, or Wolf, nicknamed 
the demon from Cuba. After sparking protests that called for his arrest in Cuba, Woof released an apology in which he blamed heavy metal music for making him sexually abuse animals. It's an apology where Woof says that metal music made him f dogs to death. Um, so I, I was going to read through what? that. I don't know. Now, in the same post, Kiro the Wolf was also exposed, though some confusion as to which receipts actually incriminated Kiro left him with an unneeded foothold to try and defend his name. Even though some of the evidence brought against him was bogus, the real smoking gun would come in the form of telegram logs, specifically a screen-capped conversation between Kiro the Wolf and fellow Zufal Snake Thing. These chat logs span over two years and thousands of messages, detailing many of the sick fantasies Kiro has involving animals, but also archiving Kiro's admission that he raped his dog, Koda. Snake Things, in a bout of criminal stupidity, shared his logging credentials with someone who generously allowed these logs to see the light of day, but that wouldn't stop Kiro from trying to discredit the evidence by first claiming it had been faked, and then that his Telegram account had been hacked. The only thing missing from this bingo card is blaming mental illness. Of course, saying that your account was hacked only after the incriminating evidence has come to light is a pretty bad look on its own. Kiro decided to upload a screenshot to Twitter showing his active sessions history on Telegram as a desperate last effort to try and clear his name. This screenshot turned out to be complete BS, and Kiro admitted so later in an interview. Because the best thing to do when you're accusing someone else of fabricating evidence is to go and fabricate your own evidence. As a final nail in the coffin, tweets consisting of side-by-side -side comparisons between Kiro's garage and the garage in one of the videos of an animal being sexually abused were posted. Further linking Kiro to zoo sadism not just as a viewer, but as a director for some highly illegal porn. With the police now investigating and the furry fandom turned against him, Kiro went dark for two years. Unfortunately, even with the mountain of evidence against him, there was no justice for the animals Kiro the Wolf abused. And the known zoo sadist even saw fit to resume posting videos to YouTube just four months ago. In one of these videos, where Kiro likens whistleblowers exposing a zoo sadist and pedophile ring to cancel culture, a friend of his named Kit the Solus criticizes the Twitter leaks for posting their evidence online instead of turning it over to the police. While reporting somebody quietly like this may not get you any real fame or recognition, it is a lot more effective because while cancelling somebody on social media does cause outrage, harassment, and the doxing of that particular individual, it doesn't actually do anything in the long run. It may drive them away for a short time, but it also gives them the option to lie low, change their name, and try again when the heat dies down, rather than have to deal with heavy fines and even incarceration for what they've done. Now, while this is a fair point to make on its own, an unintended consequence of Kit's criticism is that he seems to be suggesting Kiro should have been thrown in jail. In another video called Moving Forward, Kiro taunts other furry community figureheads like Majira and Beta Ella for speaking out against him, claiming that the negative attention has helped him achieve his view count goals. This is honestly the most telling thing all. For someone who claims to feel such a belonging with the furry fandom, Kiro only seems interested in using his status as a pariah to drag other notable furries down with him, and then second-hand brag about view goals, maybe out of jealousy or a defense mechanism. To Kiro, it feels like the abuse of defenseless animals is some kind of joke, or a game where the outrage he receives becomes the vehicle for passing just another viewership goal. He holds the fact that he has not been arrested over people's heads, exploiting the lack of enforcement against cybercrimes inherent in our justice system to manipulate people into believing that this is indicative of his innocence. Kiro claims that he will always be a part of the furry fandom in some shape or form, and this only inspires pity for those who have to put up with the putrid rot of criminal activity and animal abuse Kiro causes people to associate with furries. Even though, at this point in time, people like Kiro aren't always brought to justice, the least we can do is not give him the satisfaction of his videos being viewed and avoid his channel. Do you want to know the most messed up thing about this? He's not even the worst animal abuser on our list.
In the last video, we had several people in the comments saying that our list was invalid because we had missed some sort of zoo file podcast. We have to say right now that those people were 100% correct. The Zooier Than Thou podcast is actually one of the most distressing YouTube channels I've ever seen. And if the Kuro the Wolf segment bothered you or made you want to click off the video or was just a little bit too much, then the Zooier Than Thou podcast will be much, much more of that. I filmed a bunch of footage of my family pets. I'll be adding in footage where I can, and I'll be showing receipts when I can. However, I'm mostly just going to be talking about some of the abhorrent things spread through this podcast and talk about why these people need to get off of YouTube right now. Basically, pretend it's the creepypasta days and feel free to turn off the video and just listen. Despite having a comparatively small audience to everyone else on our list, every person on the podcast believes that family pets as well as wild animals can consent to sex. It just, to what degree, is what makes them different. With that premise in mind, these individuals use their scripted podcasts to talk about their own experiences with having relations with animals and openly advocate interspecies relationships. Infuriatingly enough, many of the creators of this podcast claim to be autistic and spend their time discussing the finer points to having relations with animals. For example, a dog can totally consent to having sex according to Toggle the Rat, but can a fish consent? And what kinds of fish can consent? Can dogs consent to BDSM or is that where consent goes too far? The, the fucking less I say about dog BDSM, the better. But that is a topic that is discussed and their conclusion may or may not surprise you. They talk about all of this and more while failing to understand that sex with any animal is rape. Saying a dog can consent is like saying a kid or a heavily intoxicated person can consent. And that's horrible. The primary purpose of the Zooier Than Thou podcast is to normalize the act of having a romantic relationship with an animal. Judging by many of the tweets they sent, comments I've seen, and emails they've read on the show, it's working. They latch themselves onto the LGBT movement with their own hashtag that has been spreading around, LGBTQZ, with the Z standing for Zoophile. The podcasters even compare the struggles faced by animal bestiality enthusiasts with the struggles of homosexuals and trans people during the Stonewall riots, which is, if you know anything about that, again, tone deaf and horrible. People even email in and use them as a point of contact within the small zoo community. At this point, these creators completely advocate avoiding treatment or removing the dog or other family pet from the abusive situation. In fact, if you don't openly advocate for a zoo's right to have a relationship with a dog, they will call you bigoted, referring to people like me as anti-zoos. What's extremely disturbing to me that I've noticed while listening to their podcasts is the friendly candor and childlike demeanor that many of the podcasters take. I'm Toggle, and I'm wanted in three states for being extremely cute without a license. And I'm Kion, and I'm thoroughly ready to make wise security decisions. They do everything to make these horrible concepts and ideas seem pleasant, taking on a soft, laid-back atmosphere while they advocate the sexual exploitation of animals. The juxtaposition of happy, chill lounge music with the jovial way the hosts defend the absolutely disgusting positions they hold is nothing short of unsettling. Despite this, Toggle and the rest of the Zooier Than Thou podcast use a series of puppet accounts to spread their message of zoo acceptance, with their primary space being a website called zoo.wtf, which I need to heavily censor because nudity, but also I now need to keep track of what Google's recommending me because I don't want to know what they're going to do with zoo.wtf being in my search history. It seems that they advocate users to re-upload their episodes wherever and whenever they can. So if you remove one channel, it's likely that more will pop up. 
If you're interested in finding out more about the individuals behind a podcast, I highly recommend Toad McKinley, who did a multi-part video series, with each video being about 40 minutes in length, discussing the individual crimes hosted by the degenerates of this podcast. Fortunately, after several phone calls and emails, I was able to confirm with the Butler County, Pennsylvania Coroner's Office, via the Zelianople Police Department, that Doug Spink did indeed die of a particularly painful, nasty, and aggressive cancer on January 23rd of 2020. It's very well done, however, some of these stories sink so far into depravity, I found myself needing to take a break from the computer, and this kind of killed my motivation to keep researching into these people that much more. Honestly, I don't think I need to do that much more research. These people openly have sex with their own animals, and they advocate you do it too. I mean, they have an opening theme song where they say, Hey, can I say they got me howling at the moon, and whoa, don't you know that love is wilder when you are a zoo? It, what the hell? It just pisses me off. If a bunch of mentally deranged animal torturers pontificating about the finer points of animal rape wasn't bad enough, at this point, I don't even know what to do. YouTube should terminate all the channels that re-upload this horrible content, of course, without saying, but they have in the past and they just make new accounts. I would advocate getting the police involved, but again, due to the anonymity of all the membership, I'm not even sure where to point their efforts. It's going to take someone that's close to these individuals personally in the furry community to really do anything about it. So for now, I just don't know what to do. If, but I can say without a doubt that if anyone needs to be stopped, it's the Zooier Than Thou podcast. This is the podcast that advocates you avoid treatment, hurt animals, all the while sexually abusing and hurting family friends themselves. There's nothing I can personally do about it, and that's the most messed up thing about this. There is no happy ending. Maybe by pointing more people at the situation and getting people, you know, eyes on this, something can happen. But right now, everything's up in the air, and the Zooier Than Thou podcast exists. Hey, it looks like you made it to the end of yet another video, but before you click off, I just quickly want to ask, if you happen to know of any weird or obscure disturbing games, can you put that in the comments below? I'm currently taking suggestions as I'm working on a disturbing video game iceberg, and I just kind of want to pull the community to see if I could find anything more. Also on top of that, we're working on disturbing animated music videos, which we're still taking submissions for because, wow, that's a vast subject and I don't know where to look. If you happen to know of anything good, feel free to leave it in a comment comment below and it might get included in a video and I'll throw you a shout out. Now with that out of the way, I'd love to thank the editors of this video, Christopher Lotus who really came through for me and your friendly gamer who basically made it so that I could get this out in a timely fashion, which we're going to do our best to switch to a one video a month schedule moving forward. Of course, that is only possible thanks to the amazing people on Patreon, which we're going to list off now. At $75 to $100, we have Ali Elman, the true vapor wave god and tara workman at 50 we have nicole strokes willow firefox and william hyatt at 20 we got alani chicken parmesan good name there buddy irene dillon and kelly marsh at ten dollars to fifteen dollars we got eddie toxman giblet nina smith and the tempernator temperator uh, they, they had a short name down there but i had to cut it out because of space and then we have all the rest of you. Honestly, everyone who's donated anything has helped me out immensely. Basically, I use the Patreon money to pay editors and help me produce more music that is completely and 100% unique to the channel. If you're interested in buying that, of course, we have the Bandcamp where you can just tip me five bucks and you get it all. But of course, any patron who donates any amount of money gets the entire soundtrack for the channel for free. Now, this video is finally done. And I can move on to fun stuff like a live stream this Sunday at 5 p.m. EST where we're going to be playing Guilty Gear Strive with my fan base, as well as answering any Q&A you guys might have. And also I'm going to be ending the video. Goodbye, you weird premiere people that stick to the end of these things. Godspeed to all of you.